pretty much. Thanks, Kenneth. Okay, thanks everyone for being here today. Can you guys all hear me okay in the back there? Cool? All right. Right, so my name is Neil Tan. Um, I'm here to basically try to answer you guys five questions about MicroTensor. Uh, basically, the question are who, what, how, why, and where. So uh, let's start with who first. We are software engineers, data scientists, and physicists and researchers. Just a small group of people, um, you know, who share two common interests: machine learning and embedded systems. So what do we try to do here? Essentially, we are trying to move, like make TensorFlow inferencing to run on the smallest device possible. So in this case, the microcontrollers. I'm showing this particular microcontroller here um, just as an example because uh, this is the microcontroller we will be using for showing you guys the one small demo after this one. The microcontroller in this case ha is running at 100 megahertz, has then much less than uh, one megabyte of uh, RAM. You know, this is actually like 320K. It's actually quite large for a microcontroller, right? But, you know, it has a touch screen and everything, so let's give it a break. Um, has a flash memory, but the most important thing here is the power. Some of those microcontrollers are meant to be run on quant cell battery for like months. So, um, compared to running things on maybe PC, GPU, or cloud, I, I, well, personally, I think this is probably one of the uh, most important differences here is the power consumption. Now let's uh, just look at a brief demo. So what you see here beside the beer and banana, <laughs> um, well, this is the map console I was showing, and that's a touch screen. We attempt to draw something there, press a button, and see if it gives back the uh, correct result. So that's me writing stuff with another developer on this project as well. Okay, so you can just barely see it, I drew a three and return the three as well. We only have so much time to make this demo, so we didn't even have time to figure out how to print the uh, proper text, uh, text bigger. But if you squeeze your eyes, you can kind of see that's an eight. Um, so on the slides, if you want, you, if you guys want to check out the demo, there's there's a link here. So this is basically the neural network um, we have been running. It's really basic, um, you know, just a multi-layer perceptron, four the connected layers. Uh, it's trained on the uh, MNIST data set. And the lowest uh, memory footprint we can put this on the microcontroller is about 256K. But if you do the math, it's actually taking less than 100K. You just other things that we need to get the touch screen and whatever uh, um, operating system running does also take the RAM. But there's a lot of room to be optimized here. Um, right. And let's talk about how we do this. So there's a few techniques in use here. Um, the first one is quite important. It's called quantization. As you know, most of the graph in TensorFlow is in uh, floating points, which each value takes about 32 bits. But Peter Warden, if you Google him up, um, has a really interesting blog which tells you how to convert the floating point into fixed point, which pretty much goes from 32 bits into 8 bit. So it turns out that for inferencing, this is pretty much all you need. As a result, we save about 75% of the memory. 
And the other major difference is that um, in most machine learning framework running on cloud PC, we have the luxury of memories. So, uh, it, it, so the result is a lot of unused tensors or buffers data are being kept in the memory, even though it's not used for, for computation. But uh, what we have done in MicroTensor is use dynamic tensor allocation, which uh, we work out exactly which tensor is needed and load it from the storage or just kill it from the memory to guarantee that you have maximum room for computation here. And because um, microcontroller is so tiny, you really want to guarantee that you're using the minimum amount of uh, code and memory as possible. That also include, uh, we are trying to work around from having uh, specific functions to parse the graph and do other things. So what we did is we take, oops, sorry, we, we would just get the um, TensorFlow graph and just convert it into C++ code. We'll talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. Uh, there's no dependency on um, math libraries such as eigens. Um, we pretty much took, mo rewrote many of the mathematical routine to guarantee the, uh, uh, the smallest memory footprint possible. I mean, at least that's what we are trying to do now. We use embed for rapid uh, prototyping on MCU. If you guys never heard of embed, I encourage you guys Google it up. It's pretty awesome for developing micro for microcontrollers. So this is the, t uh, the workflow here. Uh, we first cr uh, collect the data, uh, feed the data into TensorFlow, make your network of choice, and we train your model. And that turns out to be a protocol buffer file, a graph. MicroTensor takes the graph, generate the C++ code, and also it has a runtime library to be included and imported into embed. Then it get compiled, and you flush and run on the uh, microcontroller. That's basically the flow. And just to reiterate on that one, um, this is actually the actual command as I was trying to, you know, run and make the readme file uh, for the project. You will give it a graph to the MicroTensor CLI command line interface. And then this little program here, extract the parameter from the graph, which is your weight, and save it somewhere for you to import onto your device. Also, it generates um, the C++ file uh, you will need to, to do an inferencing on the microcontroller. And this is uh, roughly the bin resulting binary in terms of the size, all right? Um, the whole pie chart here is about 300K for the binary. Uh, but this is not the most up-to-date result. As in, a matter of fact, just a few days ago, one of the developer, Michael, back in Austin, was managed to shave uh, about 66% of the, the, uh, the size of the original 300K. So the whole thing right now is about uh, mostly the, the uh, we, we were saying from this portion, the whole thing is about 100 something K. Um, but the idea is you can kind of see exactly this. This is the microtensor part here. You get the microtensor library, and you got you have the generated graph. The whole thing for the um, for the MLP network I was I was presenting earlier is about twenty six to thirty k. So that's roughly the size you can expect. And yeah, there's further information to be done here, but this is the current state of uh, the work right now. As for the design, uh, MicroTensor have three classes. Let's talk about the two classes first. Um, operator class is pretty much uh, what you can think of as like uh, convolution, uh, metric multiplication, 
add, subtract, stuff like that. Um, it would take multiple tensor objects here and output to multiple tensor objects, pretty much the input and output. Um, right now, we implement the C reference implementation. But in the future, hopefully, as you guys or your old developer is interested in this, you will have like SIMD implementation or SPI if you have external accelerator for uh, your co computation. We have no idea what kind of hardware will be going out there, so we want to make this future proof by defining a good interface to interface with whatever implementation we're gonna face in the future. Also, you can implement network interface here, which can potentially do distributed computation here. For the tensor class, right now we only implement the RAN tensor, and Kazami sitting right there for, for as a, another developer we have is implementing, or he has already implemented the um, paging system, which allow you to paging and out of the uh, say the flash memory on the microcontroller, for example. The idea is to allow you to run any size of deep learning model we have right now on the trade-off of the computation time. Let's talk about why they are doing this in the first place. Um, right, so this is a graph. I sort of have everything organized, not to scale. This is how I have things organized in my head. On the horizontal axis here, we have the cost and area. If you look at different platform here, you have cloud, GPU, CPU, uh, application processing unit. If you go toward that direction, toward cloud, is more costly. But then at the same time, on the vertical axis, you will have more performance. What we have seen is that um, for most machine learning, well, training is a bit different, but it is for inferencing. Most machine learning stuff has been uh, rely like has been laying on the, the your right hand side of the um, the slides here. So you get cloud, you get GPU, CPU, a, a APU here. But there has been a barrier really to move inferencing from you know all the all the good stuff onto the MCUs. So that's primarily due to the tools. Uh, uh, back in the days, we didn't really know how to move the machine learning stuff onto here because there's really no dedicated tools in place for us to do so. In fact, when we were writing MicroTensor, we kind of needed uh, a few tools to to sort of help with this, and the algorithm quantization and stuff weren't weren't really in place at the time. Most of the machine learning framework are optimized for accuracy, but not really for the size and the speed. Back in the days, MCU not is not as fast as today, so. You know, it kind of makes sense to like it's make it possible that MCU is faster now to do to do inferencing on the MCUs. And why we are and sorry. So some of the application of uh, device AI include like sensor fusion. You can fuse multiple sensors together. And for IoT device, because the bandwidth are typically low, you cannot resend the full image or audio data back to the server. So it makes sense to do inferencing on the device and then just send the result back to the cloud. And MCU typically have a long standby time because it's a low power consumption, lower cost. We believe all these points would enable like new use cases in the future. Okay, so this is the last slide we have. So pretty much where. Um, as you guys can see that uh, the GitHub address is here. If you guys are interested, please check it out. Uh, we are currently just a bunch of uh, embedded developers and data scientists. But we, are, we welcome all discipline to sort of, sort of join this project and or to use it. PRs are welcome. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Neil. We have plenty of time for questions. Okay. Thank you. Hope it keeps going. All right. Uh, any questions? Anyone?
Okay, simple question. Uh, so you train your model uh, using floating point and then transpose to it to 8-bit, or you uh, need to start your training from uh, assum uh, from assumptions that uh, you will need uh, uh, integer numbers uh, all the way down. So the training is done on the simple tensor flow, or you need to adapt it and tensor flow for training. Ah, okay. That's a very good question. Um, we do all the trainings on TensorFlow. Um, what happens is if you train any graph uh, with TensorFlow just regular way, the TensorFlow actually provides uh, some script for you to do the grass freezing and quantization. So when you do the quantization using TensorFlow's tools, you will insert a bunch of quantization operators in your original graph. And what we did here is also porting those quantization operator to the micro uh, to micro tensor. That's why they are compatible. But yes, training is done in floating point. But there's tools for us to convert everything from floating point to uh, fixed point to run on the MCU. Question. So, do you plan to support more uh, complex networks like convolutional neural networks, this kind of things? Yes, but we are all doing this on our spare time right now. But we have defined the interface for you know, everyone who's, well, hopefully we make it easy enough for people who, who want to implement their own operators can just easily just take a code and start sort of implementing it. But yeah, like as time goes by, we expect to see more and more operators being implemented. And last question, have you seen TF Lite um, by, by Google? Yes, uh, we, we saw it very recently. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I think it's a really, really cool idea, um, but I haven't really sort of spent personal time in sort of exploring, but it's definitely one area we should explore. Uh, we know TensorFlow Lite is probably not currently supporting MCUs, so that could be one of the major difference here at the moment. Okay, thank you. What is your most restrained uh, resource? Is it uh, from your uh, operation? Is it uh, MC, uh, CPU, RAM, flash? OK, uh, that's a very interesting question. Um, when we were designing the thing, we were kind of assuming the use cases might not be so time sensitive. So it's going to be real, uh, near real time, but it's not going to be give you like 20 frames per second or something, right? So give, keeping that in mind, I would say it's a RAM. Um, Basically, the more RAM you have, stuff like SGN and uh, convolution takes a lot of memory. So the more RAM you have, the less power it consumes, and the faster it runs. So that's I, personally, I, was, I think that's one of the key things. Yeah. And growing your networks, uh, it will again be RAM, your major scaling. Uh, you mean if you want to make a bigger network? Yeah. Yes, I would say so, especially in the fully connected uh, layer. Uh, the measure multiplication thing is just so large. But as I was mentioning, like Kazami has sort of uh, implementing this uh, virtual memory or paging thing, hopefully to make things a bit easier. There's always a trade-off between designs, but yeah, that's what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Neil. All right. Thanks, guys. Good.